we are called to be architects of the future. We're not as victims. We're called to be commanders of the anti apocalypse. We're called to be problem solvers, visionary designers to build assumptions in the case of some of the past. To be truly radical is to make hope possible, not despair of convincing what is possible when we couple the moral vision with technological capability and capacity and resource efficiency. What do we get? Technology is the way of organizing the universe so it becomes us. Who are we? What do we want? Can we succeed? The answer is yes, we are. We are winning this race, this battle, this apocalyptic showdown. Just look around, open those beautiful eyes. We are hardwired for justice. Love never dies. And you are making the difference. Philosophical implications. I like to think that us human beings 
are hardwired for justice, that uh, if something is unfair out there in the world, we're going to have <coughs> uh, Ralph Nader, uh, some of you are familiar with him, maybe most of you, a crusading uh, uh, advocate for uh, consumer rights and safety in the United States. I heard him talk about a month ago, and he gets up and he says, he's talking about the Occupy movement in the United States, and he says, any movement that wants to win has got to answer the following question. Is it fair? And I think that uh, is it fair, and this hardwired for justice are related concepts, and I think my personal view is that we are hardwired. I, mean, I, I think you can see this in little kids as well as in, in monkeys, that uh, there happens to be some sensibility about what's fair, what's just. Uh, my two children uh, are constantly, not constantly, but regularly argue if one has to do a chore like wash the dishes and the other one gets off to do something else, they're constantly, well, that's not fair. And um, all right, back to this. Good morning. Um, we want to run through these introductions. You've heard um, a lot from me. Um, the way we're going to do this is going to be fairly arbitrary. I'll allow you to volunteer. If no one volunteers, I will call on uh, somebody. We'll start, you know, front table or something. By the way, we want to have those of you who are sitting on the chairs in the back. Uh, we want to have everybody at a table. We want to have about three to four people at each table. We could have five at a table if need be. So there's this table up here that needs uh, some more folks. Um, the tables are going to come in handy. You'll see, um, not just as a writing surface, but um, so this table up here, either one of the front tables can take four or five in the back. Where are you welcome to join any table but that one, which already has five. Last night I asked you to uh, improve, you know, answer the questions that were up on the screen. Um, some of them are fairly easy, at least the first one is. The rest of them are, could be interpreted in a variety of different ways that could be very difficult. Uh, so who wants to go first? And the way I would like you to go first is to stand up and speak clearly so that everybody can See, start off by saying your name, something I neglected to put up there, but my name, where you're from, where you're going, three important things that happened to you last year, five words that describe you. Who wants to go first? Yes. Of course, it's a developing country. 
And um, I'll go to, to the second question. Well, first, one of the important things that happened to me is personal growth. Um, I came to realize that there are some issues in the world that I had a perspective for them that changed. That's first thing. Second thing is the increase in experience in the United States. Because if you know Africa and the United States are developing countries and these developing countries, their culture, uh, infrastructure development, political systems are different. So there was an increase in understanding of in, in, uh, in, in the experience itself increased. Um, the third one, I think I made my resolutions before the end of, of that year, of the year 2011, that's December. I made some resolutions that I should put more effort and I accomplish more goals that I, you know, I had the plan to accomplish, but I, I never completed. And then, first one that describes me is that I work best, I'm, I'm a team, team worker. I work best in teams, with people, or when I'm alone, I don't feel good. So, the second word that describes me is um, what that first book of, uh, I'm social, and then I'm cooperative. I'm unworking, I am optimistic, and lastly, um, let me see. <laughs> All right, the last one, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I love people, so. I can finish with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who wants to go next? And the five words can be, it's like a hike to home. We're probably going to do it at the end as well. They may or may not change, but next. One of the words that describe you should have been brave because you went first. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yuna uh, Jok. Uh, it's very hard sometimes for people to say, but it's my name. So it's like a lot of other people's names. Um, I come from South Sudan. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about South Sudan. It's, um, it was one of the Sudan. When Sudan used to be one of the largest countries in the continent of Africa. Uh, Sudan has been one of the countries that have had a long civil war. Than, other, than most of the countries in South Sahara Africa. Um, three, uh, three things that happened to me last year. Um, I graduated from a KD University with my MA uh, in Peace and Conflict Resolution. And also, uh, the other thing that happened to me the most was uh, the independence of my country. Uh, in July 9th of last year, South Sudan gave me independence and I was very happy because uh, millions of people died for the cause of the war and millions of people have been displaced into uh, global north and global south. When I say global south, I mean, I mean uh, developing countries in Africa or in Asia, Middle East, and uh, some in North America and Canada, Australia. And also, um, most importantly, um, last year um, I learned about Jeff, you know, through um, Everett and uh, Wayne Jacoby. And I was involved in most of the work that they do in, about social justice issues in the United States. So pretty much um, I do some work with Jeff uh, now and on. And also, uh, five words that would describe me, I would say, uh, the first thing is uh, um, Mr. Survivor. Um, you know, through the course of the conflict in South Sudan, uh, I've managed to 
uh, <laughs> for the mechanism of how it costs a lot. Because you have to have, you have to be a survivor. If you're not a survivor, things might not go your way. And also, um, I'm, I'm a hardworking person. Um, I work hard to achieve my goals and all my potentials. And also, um, I'm a very creative person. You know. Uh, another thing is I'm a teamwork person. I like working teams. Uh, uh, teamwork sometimes can be challenging because not everybody can work in a team. Uh, you can form a group of put a person, but there's going to be people who might slack off. But um, I, I like that to work as a team and make work accomplish as fast as I could. Also, um, I'm a risk taker. You know, I like to take risks. Uh, some people are afraid of risk, but I could take risks anywhere in the world. You know, if somebody say go to Afghanistan today, I will go there. And then somebody will say no, I'm not going because it's more than Afghanistan. If people in Afghanistan or in, in New Delhi could survive uh, the uh, despite economic disparity of life or conflict related, anybody can survive. So I can have a risk taker. So. So then I met Wayne and uh, things just kind of happened from there. 
Uh, and then I am actually interning with Jim. Uh, so that, that also happened, it was so exciting for me. And um, I also graduated from college, so I'm gonna be starting graduate school in the fall. Uh, the psych major, I graduated from here. And um, five words that describe me, I wrote uh, creative, because I'm very artistic, I paint and draw, and you know, I like to cook, and just anything creative, I love it. Um, and then the next thing is I'm funny, uh, let's make people laugh, let's make people smile. Um, and I'm very spiritual, I'm religious, and um, I'm also driven, which can kind of be interpreted as stubborn too, because like once I get an idea about something, I just have to keep pursuing it until it happens, you know what I mean, I can't get it out of my head. Um, and I'm also empathetic, um, can really relate to almost anybody, different people, different cultures, love to meet people, love to learn about things that I've never seen or heard of before, so I'm really happy to be here and happy to meet all of you, so thank you.
who at this table wants to volunteer? Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm originally uh, from New England, from Maine, but my whole family is now in the Philly area, so I'm kind of a Philadelphian. Um, heading hopefully to France in January, so that's going to be interesting, studying abroad. Um, three important things that happened to me last year. I interned with a political campaign in Philly and hated it, and that kind of changed my whole outlook on, I'm a political science major, but I hate politics, so, but I love it at the same time, it's kind of awkward. Um, another thing is, my mom started keeping bees and learning about sustainability and really important things, and uh, kind of changed my outlook on a lot of stuff, and that's kind of what brought me here. Um, I can't think of anything that happened. Five words that describe me. I'm excited, really eager to learn, um, really talkative. Optimistic. That's about it. Next. Where's he going on this front table? Then I'm going to go over to that table next. Do you want to go? Okay, so I'm Julia. Once I graduate high school, I'm going to be a teacher. I don't know what for yet, but um, important things that happened to me last year. Well, I went to Scotland. I started high school, and I also graduated eighth grade, so that's kind of important. And then I'm caring, nice, outgoing, trustworthy, and optimistic. I've been thinking about what to do in life for 
past eight years or so, still have no idea. Uh, three important things that happened to me. Unlike Rachel, I did. Uh, I also did an internship, but I didn't like mine. Uh, I'm actually currently doing it, not right now, but like next week on, I'll start again. And uh, that sort of gave me some perspective to, you know, I sort of wanted to do something in politics. Another important thing that happened to me was uh, becoming an RA here last year. It's really kind of cool because you get, uh, we were talking about perspectives yesterday, you get like a whole different sort of perspective of living here in that, in the sense that you get other people's problems and you have to like help them through that, all that jazz. It's really kind of a unique perspective and a very fun job at times. It can be stressful, but that comes with the territory. Another important thing that happened to me, uh, I had a bad semester last year. It's, it's, it's important because I usually just took stuff for granted, you know, I'm used to getting good grades and all that stuff. So all of a sudden, it was like a wake-up call that, you know, stuff doesn't just come easy to you. You, have, you still have to work hard for it. And when that happened, you know, it just sort of got the fire back. I got motivated all of a sudden again to do, you know, get involved and do all sorts of work and get that the GPA back up, especially when we did the job. Uh, five words that would describe me, probably intelligent, opinionated, hardworking, passionate, and unique, I guess, because I guess everyone here is unique, but I think I like to think I'm different than everyone else. Thank you. Here's the last one at this table. I think the first question is complicated to answer for me, but um, I grew up in Africa and northwestern Kenya, and now I live in Austin, Texas. So I'm kind of a combination of both. As for where I'm heading, I'd like to work for an international NGO eventually. Three important things that happened to me last year I graduated with my bachelor's in global studies from St. Edmunds University. I started graduate school in nonprofit management. And I just got back home and trip back to Kenya and also to Istanbul, Turkey. And five words that describe me I am compassionate, kind, I like to think I'm unique as well, a little strange, um, intelligence, and generous. Thank you. Uh, this table, who has been spoken here? Dennis. Yes, good morning, guys. My name is Dennis Fred Okema. I come from Uganda, a country the British call the part of Africa after the Berlin Conference during, during colonization. Uh, I grew up in the northern part of Uganda in conflict situation that took place for 24 years. Many of you would relate to this situation when I mentioned the con in 2012. That's where I'm from. I'm happy to have been a victim of the conflict and part of the solution as I work for peace and conflict for the last seven years. Uh, three important things that happened to me in last year. This is a question that really actually threw my mind to a state of confusion because last year I had some of the worst things happen to me and followed by some of the best things in life too. One, I contested for the position of a member of parliament in my country and uh, because I'm always very vocal for the plight of the poor and I'm against injustice, the government came after me to take my life, and because I resemble my brother, they killed him, thinking they had murdered me. That was a terrible thing. But God, in his way, two weeks later, his wife gave birth to a wonderful baby boy, and uh, it helped me so much to recover from that part of my terrible experience. Because every time I see the young boy, I see him. And that was a very wonderful thing that happened. Uh, the second wonderful thing that I think happened last year was uh, my trip to United States. 
when my friends decided that I should leave the country for my own safety and come to the United States, the process was smooth. I got my visa and came over and I got to a safe place with very wonderful friends who took very good care of me up to date. And I understand the gift of true friendship so well now. And I thought that was a wonderful thing that happened to me. The third very wonderful thing that happened to me last year was when I came to this same hall, I think in December, for a presentation by Melissa, who graduated from here, but she's a Hollywood movie star now, who graduated from Chestnut Hill. You could remember her from her role in the TV series uh, West Wing. And that was the evening that was, that presented me with the opportunity for one of my lifetime dream. Coming from a poor background, humble background, I always dreamt of the day when I will have my master's degree and I didn't know where and how it was going to happen. But I always wanted it to be one of the best experiences and from a wonderful institution. And on that day, in this room, the president of this college offered me a scholarship for master's degree, master's of science in administration of human services. And from the course description, it's exactly what my heart had been desiring for a long time. And that was the third wonderful thing that happened. There are so many other things that happened. I met Wayne and through him so many wonderful things have happened. I got to go to the UN, something that where I come from, the UN is known for the food people eat because they give refugees portion, that's corn, corn bread and beans. So when you say UN in my community, people think about food. And when I came here, Wayne took me to understand UN beyond food. <laughs> and that was one of the things that happened in between. Um, the five words that describe me, one, I think I am dynamic because I have learned through life that you uh, should be always be able to mingle with anyone, any group of people. When you take me among politicians, I'll survive in their discussion. Students, I'll survive. And young kids from preschool to whichever age, I'll still be relevant. So I think I am dynamic and even with the professionals I always have something to say and become be relevant. And I think the other word that also described me is empathetic. Reacting and working with people, I've learned that before you judge them, you need to understand them and that may need you to put yourself in their shoes, then you will be able to take better decision on how to relate with them. So I'm empathetic. And then I am social. I like socializing. This is a different country. The kind of socialization is different than in Africa. So I am learning, but I am sure when I know what happens here, I'll be myself, a social person. And then I am also very courageous. When faced with some of the most scary situations in life, I don't run away. I prefer to hang in there. And it has happened several times, and I like the feeling afterwards when I succeed. And the other thing is, the last, the fifth word that will describe me is that I am optimistic, always. I take it that in life, it doesn't matter how long it might take for you to get to where you want to be. There might also be some interruptions, 
terrible experience will be there along the way. But finally, you will get there and achieve what you want. And if I don't, I still feel that some of the reasons to be alive are the dreams that we may never achieve them. But it makes us work hard and gives us a reason to be alive. Sorry for the long introduction, but that's me. Thank you so much. So that was 
one of the important things that sort of merged into a cluster of other important things, uh, applying the colors and such, which I'm going to be doing when the scooter starts back up again and I become a senior in high school. Uh, five words to describe me would be curious, aware, calculated, uh, compromising, although I am opinionated, um, curious, and opportunistic. Thank you.
I was accepted into the Global Scholars Program at my school, which is hard to get into, but um, you basically analyze issues in the world and you come up with your own solutions, 25 page paper at the end of the year. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and the third thing was that I was appointed the leader of a local math club that I've been tutoring. So I got the opportunity to start my own branch of that. And um, since I'm a very mathematical person, it was great because I could bring math to kids in the community um, and you know, make them as interested as I am. Um, five words that describe me, I have to ask friends for this because I'm not very good at describing myself, but um, general consensus was that I am uh, motivated, hardworking, knowledgeable, good-hearted, and curious. So. Thank you. Uh, Right, that's everybody. Um, so, a number of things. Um, thank you all for um, making this real. Uh, your testimonies about who you are, where you're from, where you're going, what's important to you, was very moving. Uh, interesting, exciting. You're all amazing people. There's an incredible diversity in this room, as you could all hear. There's obviously a diversity of origins, native languages, of ages, all of which is going to be incredibly important as we move forward and start working. Each of you are going to bring a unique perspective and set of experiences to the tasks that we're going to be doing. In the world out there, there's a certain amount of prejudice against certain groups in here. For instance, there's a prejudice against young people. You know, you're, you're 16 or 17 years old, so therefore, we're not going to let you vote. Uh, we're not going to let you participate in you know, the rest of society. And the old folks won't call it prejudice, but you know, they'll say we're trying to look out for you or something, protect you or whatever, that's why we don't let you drink or whatever. In here, your age is going to be the young folks, I'll get to the older folks soon, but the young folks are going to have a unique advantage. You bring to the table, this design table, if you will, something incredibly important. It's, and it's not just your enthusiasm, uh, and energy or intelligence or creativity, but you're bringing something else that the old folks usually miss. And that is, is you're not, I hope, an expert yet. Uh, experts, in my rather cynical point of view, are people who know all the answers. Experts often are the ones who will justify the status quo. We can't do anything else because, you know, it, it, it's not affordable, it's, uh, you can't do it, it's politically impossible. They know all the reasons why you can't make any changes in the world. Young people don't buy into that. You know, if you can feed people, we got the technology, we got the resources, well, let's do it. So the young folks bring, for lack of a better term, blessed naivete, a questioning of assumptions, of saying that, yeah, we can do it, and we ought to do it. It's right, and so let's figure out a way around roadblocks that oftentimes us older folks are willing to accept. The older folks in this room are bringing to the table some experience, you know, whether it's their college experience, their real life experience, that will deepen and enrich and channel the enthusiasm and, and everything else that all of us are bringing to this. Everybody's got a unique set of things they're bringing to this that make them incredibly important. So thank you for all of that. There's another thing that's going on in here that I want to thank the non-native speaking, English speaking speakers. Um, as somebody who, all, who struggles with a, who has had numerous struggles with foreign languages in his life, I really appreciate all of the, uh, the work 
that you folks are putting in to speak this strange language called English. Um, it's, I appreciate it. The reason, part of the reason I'm saying this is, is aimed at us native English speakers, that we need to listen very carefully uh, to what is being said, and when you're in small groups, um, if you don't understand something, it's your job to ask for clarification. All right, so those are some of my acknowledgments that are going on in here. Um, there, you can tell from the diversity in here about the, the origins. Let me put this back. Um, the accents, whether it was somebody speaking with a Japanese or an English accent or from Africa, all, all of us are bringing to this an accent of our own life. Now I'm going to rapidly run through an introduction to you. I'm going to be presumptuous enough to introduce your, you to you again. You did it in a very specific way, I'm going to do it in a generic way. And so I'm going to start off by pointing out that you're unbelievably complex. You're the most complex, you and your nervous system are the most complex system in the known universe beside of the universe itself. All right, some people think that uh, some of us are a little bit more complicated than others. Uh, I'm not quite sure that that's true. Um, as some young man said to me the other day, well, that's not true, you know, so football is really complicated. Right? But you didn't get it. But, so you're complicated. You're also ancient. You know, where you're from is you're not 20, 15, 50 years of age, you're 14 billion, actually 13.7 billion years of age. You know, that's what the, the, the atoms that you're made out of, the hydrogen, the oxygen, the carbon, uh, all of that stuff is ancient. The genetic heritage that you embody comes, you know, two, three billion years of age, and 100,000 years ago, everyone in this room, no matter what, it, what your color, came out of Africa. Following migrating herds of, of animals, um, we started out, in, you know, the, the fossil record has us starting out in this neck of the woods, the Old White Gorge, Kenya, Tanzania area. Following migrating herds of animals north, some on the left over to Europe, others, you know, went across India, China, up through the Bering Strait where we crossed a land bridge, which was in existence then, uh, into North America 30 to 40,000 years ago. Now the reason there was a land bridge there was because so much water had been pulled up out of the oceans 25,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, there was an ice age on this planet. And this part of North America, uh, parts of Europe were covered by a giant glacier, mile two kilometers, three kilometers thick. Uh, you could also walk from China to Japan. You could almost walk all the way to Australia uh, because all the water that had been pulled out of the oceans. Um, we're talking about that's what it looked like then. This is what it looks like today. These are electric lights. Most of you have seen this already. The interesting part about, you know, there's 900, 800 million people in this part of the world. Uh, 300 million here, you can see wh where the electricity, the power is being used uh, in these parts of the world. I mentioned you were old. This is a rather lengthy quote, but one I think has some profundity to it. You're roughly 14 billion years old and were made of matter that has been cycled through multi-million degree heat of innumerable giant stars who are composed of particles that once were scattered across thousands of light years of interstellar space, particles that were blasted out of exploding suns, and that for eons drifted through the cold starlit back into the galaxy, you were very much a child of the cosmos, and giving birth to us, the universe has performed its most astonishing creative act. David Garland's an English uh, physicist. Um, so we've, however you look at it, my opinion, you're amazing. From what you're made out of to the level of complexity, and that you need to allow yourself to be astonished by the 
astonishing things that surround us constantly. People my age are often too cynical to allow themselves to be astonished. People your age are often too cool to allow themselves to be astonished. And one needs to let go of that. Life is astonishing, and I will encourage you all to, uh, let me go back. I was supposed to have been an arrow button that got me back to where I wanted to go. Uh, so I'll do it the hard way. So you're complex, you're ancient, you're rich. If you earned $5,000 last year, some of you might have had summer jobs or internships that allowed you to do that, you're in the top 14% of the people on this planet. If you or your parents earn $48,000, you're in the top 1% of the people on this planet. That does not make you rich in the United States or in Europe uh, to earn $48,000, but globally, you're in the top 1%. So you're complicated, you're ancient, you're rich, you're also powerful. Your access to technology and information and time, meaning your life expectancy, is unprecedented in the time that this planet has been in existence. You're unique from that perspective as well. You're more powerful than the kings and queens of bygone eras. You're unique. Some of you mentioned your uniqueness, you're unique on a variety of levels, one of which is that no one else has been more numerous or longer lived, richer, more powerful, they have more responsibility. You have a unique role to play in the history of the world. You're also the leader. I'll say, you know, you're not the leaders of the world, uh, and you never will be. That's because you're right now, you're leaders of the world. You don't have to wait until you can get elected or vote. Right now, you are a leader of this planet. This statement, you know, you're not leader of the world. Let me go back. Uh, it's an attempt to get your attention, but the punchline is that's because uh, you don't have to wait for it. It's here right now. Now, this field, I'll contend that you saw this slide yesterday, last night. That what's happening in the next 40 years, the next 45, 50 years, is going to be a critical time on this planet. The most critical time in the history of the planet. We could do ourselves in, or we could turn it into a utopia. Buckminster Fuller wrote a book called Utopia or Oblivion. And I think that's the choices that are in front of us. You're also lucky, hardworking, responsible, intelligent, <coughs> extremely good looking, <coughs> as well as humble. Um, you don't deserve much respect for being lucky. You were all lucky to be born where you were. Some of you had a, quote, easier time of it, but um, the luck, nobody chose to be born in your family, you just, just happened. But what you do reserve, deserve a huge amount of respect, and get it, is for all the other things the hard work, the responsibility, the intelligence, the making of a set of decisions over the last six days, six months, six years, the whole of your life that got you into this room, that gave you a set of values, a vision of the world, a perspective that said, what I do with my life is important, and I can be a change maker rather than an observer of apocalypse I can participate in making the world a better place. Um, you also happen to be unreasonable. Now, the reason I say you're unreasonable is the following, <coughs> this will work. Um, George Bernard Shaw says, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable human being. All right, now, um, we're gonna race into this thing that's called design science. And um, I'm going to uh, start it off by um, asking you all in your group, last night I asked you to uh, write down the world's uh, five most important problems. And uh, I would like you to uh, 
in your group, and you may need to, uh, this will be slightly awkward at some point in time, but <clears throat> a group discussion at a table might work better if you were you know, actually, instead of all facing the screen, you were actually in some sort of circle. So I want you in your groups to, number one, present just rapidly. You don't, don't explain them. Just say, I think the top five problems of the world are whatever, energy shortages, lack of health care, starvation, or whatever it might be. Uh, and each person presents their five most important problems to the rest of the table. And as soon as I'm going to give you maybe three minutes to do that, um, and then we're going to go into stage two on that. So as a group, tell each of the other members at your table what the five top problems are. What we're going to do now, step two, is I want to hear from each table a list of problems. It could be five if you all had a medical list, or it could be six or eight or nine problems. Uh, but I want to hear what the problems are. Just stand up and say it, or sit down, just say it loud so that everybody can hear. So we'll start with this table. Everybody needs to listen up. Wait, listen to these folks. All right, so um, all the ones that we said were poverty, water sanitation, global warming, the spreading of disease, oil crisis, human rights, health care, war, soil, education, energy, shelter, conflicts, and gender issues. So you had rarely any overlap. Now, <laughs> This is, this is partly a test of memory. <laughs> they may have to repeat them, but I want to hear any additional ones from this table. And then any additional ones from this so that we, um, if there's any problems that haven't been mentioned, I'm going to ask her to read them again. And then everybody try to remember what they are. If you, there's anything additional than what was said here, you can add it. We don't want it, we don't have to hear the same list. So say them again, real loud. Okay. Poverty, water sanitation, global warming, spreading of disease, oil crisis, human rights, health care, war, soil, education, energy, shelter, conflicts, gender issues. Anything else from this too? Social mobility. Social mobility. Okay, access to resources. Resources. Lack of democracy. Lack of democracy. Safe maternity. Safe maternity or high maternal mortality. All right, so how about this table? Is there anything in addition to what has been said so far? Okay, so another problem this table is putting out there is uh, communication problems. Lack of like technological, like cell phones and everything. Okay, this table. Um, just like general misunderstandings and cultural barriers. Okay. Cultural barriers. Um, comfort levels. People aren't willing to go out of their comfort zone. So I guess I could go with cultural. Um, <coughs> we also have the wealthy poor gap, like the standard of living is said different. Okay, the gap between the super rich and the poor, and the fact that it's getting bigger. Um, terrorism. Terrorism. Anything addition from this in this table? Okay. Drugs. Trust. Drugs. Drugs. Okay. And crime and drugs. Yes. Wait. Reproduction. Reproduction, meaning the birth rate. Okay. Corruption. Corruption. Human trafficking. Human trafficking. We are done with corruption. International debts for most developing countries. Okay. International debt to the developing countries. Also, debt just for developed countries, whether it's Greece or the United States, Spain, Portugal, uh, all over, it seems. Yes? I guess relation, relation that GDP is a measure of success. Okay, a measurement of success. 
that skewers our sense of whether we're doing okay or not, which is GDP. What else? Anything else out there? Now, that's the easy part. Oh, one more. Uh, the lack of actual power wielded by the UN. Okay, the lack of power by the UN to do stuff that they seek. That's see. enforce their policies. All right. Now, what I want the table to do as a discussion, each of you have heard the folks at your table say what the problems are. You've also heard other tables say what they see the problems are. You're welcome to change your list to include some other things like, oh, I forgot terrorism or I forgot this or that. Uh, you're welcome to add to it. That's the easy part. The next part is you have a list not of your personal five, uh, but you have a table that has got about ten of them on it. The next step has got two stages. I would like you to look at your list of five, and uh, you might think about including, make a list of five that may include everything that's out there, but the five most important, and then I want you to cut it to three. I want you to, uh, what are the three, not the five, but the three most important problems facing this planet? Do that alone with your piece of paper. As soon as, and I'm going to give you literally uh, 60 seconds to do it, starting when I'm done talking. And then when we go from that, we're going to go into a discussion at the table. What are the three most important problems? So you got 60 seconds starting now to do it by yourself. What are the uh, three most important problems facing the planet? All right. Uh, time is up. Now, there's two things I want to tell you. You're never going to have enough time in here to do all of the things that we're going to be asking you to do. Uh, there's always going to be a shortage of time. We're going to move on, even in the face of that. Some of you may have completed that task, some of you may not. The next task is you're going to have five minutes for max. And that is, is as a table as a team, as a group of people sitting here or there, I want you to come up with the three most important problems facing the planet. When that's done, we're going to hear from each of the tables. So you've got, what's now, four minutes. Um, four minutes starting now to come up with the three most important problems that your table, yeah, that you collectively think are the most important facing the planet.
So you don't have three, you've got basically no, no, one. We have three, but three minutes that is the most important. So what are the three? The, uh, another one we had was the energy, global energy crisis, because uh, you want to go first. Because my country and my uh, neighboring country of my country, they are like, facing it like hell. Or uh, we are facing uh, energy crisis at like uh, 20 hours, 
So that's huge. So you don't you don't have to uh, tell us why uh, it's so important, but empathy, energy, uh, and what? Uh, and social design and environment. Okay, social design environment. What are the three you have? <laughs> we have four. You have four. Okay, what are the four you have? Well, I don't know. I, I think we all agree that he, we said human rights for sure was one of them. Uh, so uh, we have human rights, conflicts, uh, lack of collaboration, and uh, poverty. Okay, lack of cooperation, poverty, human rights. What did I miss? Anything? Well, we also said critical infrastructure. Because, okay. Like, but we think that like water and poverty, like shelter, like that's all under that umbrella. Okay. This table, what are the three that you have that are the most important problems facing the world? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think we tried to limit it in terms of cause and symptoms. So, you know, it's something very important is actually the symptom of other things. So, bad governance. Okay. Resources misuse. limited or misuse. Yeah, limited, but the fact that they're not using them. Okay. And then something about kind of an information gap yeah. due to inequalities. Kind of, we're trying to figure out the wording. Okay. So lack of access to information. Yeah. Uh, and those are the three. Your table. What were your three? Um, we agreed on. Okay, so um, we've got one more step to go, uh, but I want to comment on process. Part of the reason for doing this is it's getting you used to uh, having a discussion amongst um, total strangers for most of you. I mean, some of you have met before who are attending the school, but um, you are trying to come to grips with um, the diversity of the group, diversity of viewpoints, diversity of languages, and uh, figuring out how we can communicate across all sorts of barriers, whether they're language or experience, um, and coming to some sort of agreement. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, and I want to acknowledge that it's not easy, but we're going to move on. Uh, the direction we're going in, uh, you can now see a trend. We went from five to three. I want now the one, number one. This group over there was had a little bit of a head start. I was glad the rest of you didn't follow their lead, or this last part would be somewhat uh, redundant. But I want you to come up with what you think, the table thinks, is the most, single most important problem facing the world. So we went from five to three to now one. What is the single most pressing problem confronting humanity? We're going to have two and a half minutes for this. I agree with what Mr. Rivera mentioned in office for years. It's pretty important. It's pretty important. Okay. Um, for some of you, this is an exer a frustrating exercise because I'm not giving you enough time. Here's an important topic. What's the most important problem? facing the world, and I'm saying you got two and a half minutes to come up with an answer or whatever. What's your, what is the sense of this table was what? Lack of collaboration. Lack of collaboration. This table. Uh, global apathy and lack of awareness. So global apathy and lack of awareness. Lack of awareness. Awareness. This table, what's the most important problem facing the world? You don't have one? Well, yeah. 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 Some of us are saying that the misuse of resources, and some of us are saying that it's a probable by management by governments, which is much government. So, hard to take one of those two. This table back there, what was yeah. your sense that, of what the most important problem was? And by the way, did you guys hear? Did you hear what everybody else said? No, there is something. Okay.
Okay, so what's your um, with, with Campbell's uh, responsibility at the state level and, uh, the, and also at the individual level? So they said, you know, um, it, it's just like good packet with government. So if the state comes to the nation, uh, So you don't set up a central 
agency, a super government, you know, the military are in charge and you're all going to do what I say or if you don't, I'll shoot you uh, or put you in jail. Um, it's a, through a, more of a democracy, if you will, a collective decision making that we as society, because we have access to the information, we're not apathetic or misinformed. We can see that we need to feed everybody because hungry children, A, is a moral outrage, but it's not based on morality. That case has been made for eons. It's based on we feed hungry children or get everybody access to health care and clean energy and health care, all of that stuff, not because it's the moral thing to do, the right thing to do, but because it makes economic sense to do it. That healthy, educated, well-fed people are much more productive than you know, illiterate, hungry, uh, uh, sick people. And that that productivity around the world leads to not just richer local economies, but the global economy is better off as well. So therefore you can make a solid, a compelling economic case for eliminating all the problems of the world. In a similar way that a strong, compelling economic case was made for the eradication of smallpox, the example I gave last night, you can make similarly compelling cases for getting rid of all the other problems confronting humanity. Just because of the impact, the positive impact it will have on not just society, but the economics of the world. Even if you're just paying attention to something as grossly inadequate, as gross national product, as your measurement of success, you can even, with that inadequate, misleading tool as a measurement of success, make a very solid case that we should be doing the right thing. All right, so um, when I engage in a quick exercise here, I'm going to ask you to suspend disbelief for a moment. And I'm going to ask you to um, go along with what I'm saying. I want you to imagine that this morning, this guy, you heard a knock on the door, wherever you were standing, whether it was the dorm or your house or whatever. And you looked out the door, and this guy was standing there. And um, you were somewhat taken aback, but he didn't have a gun aimed at you or anything. He didn't look threatening. He just, he, the knock was um, not angry. It was authoritative, but it was not, um, I'm coming to get you. It was just enough for you to open the door a little bit, and when you did, you saw that that guy who was, you could see, was surrounded by these guys. And the gentleman on the right says to you, um, he addresses you by name, and addresses you respectfully, and says, your presence is needed right now. Please uh, finish getting dressed, he notices you don't have your shoes on or something, and come with me. And you do. You go grab your shoes and you walk out the door. And as you're uh, walking out the door, you see out there are um, a couple of limousines. Uh, not limousines so much as SUVs, black, black windows. And um, around um, the walkway are guys like this. And they look, you look around and they're all over the place. They're on the rooftops. And then up ahead, uh, up above you, are some helicopters just stationary sitting at either ends of the block and you get into this SUV and drive off. And uh, you don't know what's going on, but something clearly is happening to you um, and you're escorted uh, very quickly to a room that looks remarkably like this. And you're brought in here and um, there's a other group of people and uh, you are informed then by somebody who's standing in the front of the room um, that um, there is an emergency right now. And that um, with all due apologies, um, the person in the front of the room says, look, I hate to tell this to you now. We had other plans, but this emergency has intervened. Uh, you folks have been part of a uh, lengthy training program 
And I'm sorry to break it to you now, but uh, the training program is just was a highly top secret training program, and it's now over. You have been trained since birth. You were selected for a variety of different reasons, uh, background, experience, genetics, whatever. However, whatever the selection criteria was, you were selected, and you've been trained since you were born. Almost every single thing that's happened to you has been part of this training. And the reason we brought you into this room right now and did it with such a hurried manner and so rudely, which we apologize for, um, is that there's an emergency. And uh, what the training was all about, why you were being trained, was because you were being trained to be the captains of a very large spacecraft. The spacecraft is so large that you don't know it was a spacecraft. That you happen to be actually on the spacecraft right now. It's so large you happen to assume all along that it was just a planet. Uh, it looks like this circular sphere that uh, we call Earth. It in fact happens to be a spacecraft and you have been trained to be the captains of that spacecraft. We wanted this program, this training program, to run a little bit longer, and then we were gonna brief you on all of this in a more uh, humane, slow way, but the emergency is intervening. The spacecraft is in danger, and therefore, your life is in danger. The decisions that need to be made in the uh, near future are uh, critical to the survival of the spacecraft and to your survival. That's the situation you're in. You don't know where the spacecraft is, where it's going, or what the emergency is. All you know is, is that your life and that of all the other people on the spacecraft are threatened, are in danger, uh, and the life well-being of the spacecraft itself is also in danger. So the question is, is, what information do you need to make an informed, intelligent decision that your life depends on as captains of the spacecraft? The guy in front of the room also points out that beneath here and above here are a whole bunch of rooms like this that are hooked up to every single thing out there from the internet to specialized databases. All the answers to any question you could possibly ask um, are going to be at your fingertips. With the exception of some philosophical questions, you might ask, who am I? Well, that's up to you to answer. But any questions having to do with the status of the spacecraft will be given to you uh, almost instantaneously. So what information do you want? Yes. Um, the the roles of the people surrounding me, if I have some assistance, you know, their, their willingness to assist me. Okay. First of all, I would ask. Are there other people out there that can assist us yeah. in dealing with this emergency? What the emergency is. What is the emergency? You might also want to know how are we going to know about it? What's the source of the data? Is it you know, the National Enquirer or is it some scientific report? Yes? It's something like that have, uh, has happened before because if we find if it has happened, then we have information how it was solved. Okay, good. So has it happened before? And if so, what did we do then? And if, it, if the, all of that was true, well, why is it coming back? Uh, what else do you want to know? What's the ultimate uh, results if I fail to, or on this mission of, of succeeding, the, the results, the devastation, the, the possible results of the catastrophe? If, if I don't, you know, if I respond to this um, danger and it overcomes me, if I fail, what was the, the magnitude, the gravity of the results? All right, if I'm hearing your question or what the information you want correctly, you're saying, how serious is it? What's the magnitude of the problem? Right. Like what happens if we fail? Yeah. Say that again? What happens if we fail? Like okay, or so what happens if we don't solve this problem? Is it so huge that um, 
It, it is. We do know that it's threatening to the whole spacecraft as well as all life on the spacecraft. Um, we uh, also, what yeah. happens if we fail or what happens if we do nothing? Does it go away by itself? Like if I have a cold and I don't do anything, the cold, my body will heal itself and my cold will go away. Is this similar or what? Yes. I know, I just wanted to add that we shouldn't think about that what happens if we fail, because we shouldn't fail. If it is an emergency call and if we were just called for that, then uh, it is some kind of just um, telling yourself that, oh, it's not my fault and anyway. Okay, so we can't have. fail, but what else? Yes? I think after uh, establishing what the emergency is, it's important to establish how much time you have to rest. Good. Is the place on fire and we have to run out and put the fire out right now? Or do we have Time six hours or six days or six months to deal with it? You know, is a meteorite heading towards us and it'll hit us in, you know, three years? Or is it something right now? Yes? If we know what the emergency is, what could be what, Okay, what's the cause of the emergency? We now, if we know what it is, it's reliable information, what caused it? You might, so what's its history as well? Where's it coming from? How's it going to develop through time if we do nothing? You know, it, if it's like a fire, it'll burn up the whole place, or it's, yes? Is, it, is this the right tool to solve the problem? Is it? Is it, is it, am I, is what I'm using right now, what I have, do I have enough to, to, to respond to the region? Okay, do you have enough information here? Do you feel comfortable with the answers to the questions that have been asked so far to make a decision no, that your life depends on? I'll say no. Yes? What if the, what if the uh, answer, what if the equation is not answer? If the technology is not fair? Okay, what if one of the questions we have isn't answerable? Let's assume that we can get all of the information, the vital information, the questions that you're asking about the status of the spaceship. Part of the situation is they are answerable. What else do you want to know? Why would you pick me? What makes me good? You know, who the heck picked me? And and you might also want to know how do I get out of here? Um, <laughs> is there a rescue ship? Um, is there another ship? What else do you want to know? Is it a solvable emergency? Like, is there some okay. sort of end? Is it solvable? You know what the emergency is. There's some important questions missing. What else do you want to know? What well, if we can not identify the root causes? Who caused it? The root causes. If you the root identify. cause. Yeah, if you cannot identify them. Yeah. So the cause, the history. Um, some people might want to know who's responsible so we can throw <laughs> something at them. But uh, yes? Uh, where we are, like what condition we are in right now in terms of what the problem is. Okay, what's the condition right now? Are we, uh, you know, is the air running out and half the population is already unconscious? Or, you know, we're running out of food or water or whatever. What's right now, immediately? Yes? Uh, if, I was grown, uh, if I was grown up just for solving this problem, then someone knew that this would happen, this day would just one day come uh, alive, yes? Uh, and so I want to know this someone who was just preparing me, okay. preparing me for this day because he would have known about this problem and how to solve it. So who uh, is in charge out there? Who trained us? Uh, and who is behind, you know, what's the authority that's out there? What else? Uh, what tools and resources do we have at our disposal? Good. You might want to know if you've identified what the problem is. Uh, what are the tools, the resources we have to solve the problem with? But if the, uh, the person who is supposed to be well trained is in a state of emergency and is shocked and it doesn't work. The person is, what's the question? I say, what if the person who is who well trained to do that job was in a state of emergency that we could not be able to perform his duty? Okay, so the question is, is everybody out there who we are dependent on able to fulfill their tasks? Yes? Uh, we'll be able to cooperate with the team we're given, the people we're surrounded with. Okay, we're going to be able to make a decision and cooperate. You might also want to know, do we all speak the same language? You might want to know how many other people are out there on the spacecraft and where they are and what their condition is. 
What else might you want to know? Yeah. Do you have a backup plan to solve that? Okay. You might also, you, you, you said, what's our backup plan? You might want to ask before the backup plan, what is our plan? If we figured out what the problem is, um, there's some important questions here. You know, what are the alternatives? You know, okay, we got this problem. What are the possible solutions? Then you might want to know what are the other solutions, the backup plans. If here's plan A and here's plan B and C and D. You deserve a um, ship on there. Is there a, yeah, or an escape hatch or something like that. But you might want to know what the alternatives are, but there's a critical question that still hasn't been asked. Yes? Uh, it is an artificial problem, and it can be solved really easily. Okay, is it an artificial program or a problem or a real one? Assume it's real. Uh, it's not a training exercise. Yes? Yes, everyone or majority have confidence in handling the problem. Does everybody has, have, has, have confidence in it? If everybody tries to. But they have confidence in you. Um, meaning it's an authority question. Assume you have the authority to do it. Um, are they going to trust your decision? Are they going to go along with us, whatever you decide to do? Yes? Uh, how many individual problems do you have? So how the problem connecting each other? Okay, is it one problem or is it a whole bunch of problems? And are they interrelated? Here's the key question you haven't asked yet. No one has asked, you know, where is the spaceship right now? And where is it going? And then the, the most important question it is where you want it to be going. If you, if you got, here's where it's located and here's the problem, and it's going this direction, but maybe you want it to be going this direction. It's rare that the direction that you want it to be going and it is going is the same thing. So once you've determined where you want it to go, you might now say which of the alternatives, the options that we have, is going to get us closest to where we want to be going. Yes? Well, I think that uh, that question would be logical in this situation because it's an, as, as an assumption of the question. And the first thing that we ask us to assume is that you are an expert, you have been trained, and these people are calling you because they believe that you know the ship, you are not, you're not a job. So, in this situation, we assume that if you are caught and those people came for you, you will be able to bring the data and the spaceship will just need to keep where it is. So, from there, the, the, the question will be you will both them on the main problem itself, not the technicality or the situation of the machine. Because, I mean, there is, you take it this way. Is a bridge between the two and the problem to be solved. So you must know the space between it if you are an expert and you are being caught. So making that assumption, yes. I don't think that question will be up to So in your analysis, you know, right here is where we are. Right. This is where we want to be. Right. And we want to build a bridge between the two. Yes. And this might be over here or over there or over here. Yes. We want to determine where we want to be going. Do we want, yes. and then the criteria is how do we solve the problem in the quickest possible way for everybody, not just so that we can survive, but as captains of the spacecraft, you've been given the responsibility to steer it, to solve the problems for 100% of the world without destroying the spacecraft right. in the process, without destroying its life support systems, um, so you've asked questions about where are we, how serious is it, how much time do we have, what are the resources and the tools we have to work with, what are the options, the alternatives, which one, you've formulated some decision making criteria that will tell me which of the options that are available, there might be 10 or 100 different things we could possibly do, but which ones are going to take us to the goal that we want, the destination, Now, something happens. One of you leaps up on the table and says, aha. You scream it out. Actually, you don't say aha. You say something else. You've got all the information from all of these different uh, questions that you've been asking. All the data comes in. You look at the data and you yell out, it's alive. People look at you, what are you talking about? And you say, all the data indicates 
that the spacecraft is a living system. It is alive. Now, what information do you want to know about the spacecraft? How old is it? How old is it? What else? Good. Is it healthy? Or is it dying? You know, is it, how old is it? Is it young? Has it just been born? Or is it ancient? Is it healthy? Yeah. What are its limitations and what are its friends? Okay. What are its limitations? He said, what are its friends? No, no, strengths and weaknesses and all that stuff. The strengths and strengths and weaknesses. Who was in charge before us? Okay, who was in charge before us? What happened to them? <laughs> yes? Um, who or what created it? What? Who or what created it? Okay, who or what created it or built it? You might also want to know if it's a living system, what does it eat? Uh, and hopefully the answer isn't, you know, human beings. Uh, yes? Is it self-sustaining? Is it what? Self-sustaining. Is it self-sustaining? It goes along connected with how healthy is it? Is it dying? Uh, and if it is ill, um, what caused it to be ill? Or if it's young, just being born, is there something that, you know, what do we know about it? Anything else you want to know? Uh, what is its metabolism? What's its metabolism? Uh, all right. So all of these things are questions that um, we want to know. You know, where are we? What's our situation? Where are we going? Where do we want to be going? Um, these are the kind of questions that um, we need to be asking and answering about Spaceship Earth. An important part of this is that the list of questions that you need to ask and answer to make an informed, intelligent decision about the entire spacecraft or a local part of it are finite. They are not an infinite number of questions you need to ask and ask and ask and ask. There's a set of them that after you get the answers, you can take an informed action. It's very important to realize that, that it doesn't, the questions don't go on forever. What we have to know about the world to make a rational, informed decision is not finite. The questions also can be categorized into different uh, groupings. You know, one's dealing with resources, one's dealing with the destination, one's dealing with alternatives. Um, the categories, you know, having to do direction, purpose, resources, implementation. How do we implement it? Um, it's a question that needs to be asked and answered. Um, so we're going to be asking and answering all of these types of questions as we go through the week, having to do with uh, something a little bit more specific than the fate of the entire spacecraft. But the methodology nevertheless applies to the whole uh, system as well as to local systems. You could ask these same questions about um, your hometown in you know, Connecticut or the South Sudan or United Kingdom or you know, Brunswick, New Brunswick, New Jersey or Philadelphia or this college. Um, so we want to find out you know, where we are and um, where we want to be going. The where we want to be going has got some um, serious implications. So let me go back to that. Um, you all identified earlier as part of the table what was the most important problem facing the world. Uh, I would like you to also, you did it, attempted to do it, accomplished it, maybe accomplished it in um, too quick a time or not satisfactory, you're not all in agreement on it. You may never get agreement on what the most important problem is facing the world. Um, but you, as a group, but you certainly will uh, as an individual. And so I'd like you to pursue that uh, exercise for you as an individual in your notebook uh, sometime today to go from the five to the three to the one as an individual. 
as you, uh, what do you think is the most critical problem confronting humanity? You already, may already be there. You, know, you, you may in fact agree with the table that this is the, the, the particular problem we want to confront. I want to move from that general state of uh, the world, you know, this, what's the big problem, back to the game that we were just doing, the space captain game where you were in charge of the world. And I want to ask you one of the questions that came up was where do we want to be going? Not where is the world heading? That's a prediction. You know, in 20 years we're going to have, you know, 8.5 billion people and we're going to have this much energy consumption and you can extrapolate trends into the future and quote predict the future with some degree of accuracy but I want a totally different thing from you I want you to describe the world that you want rather than and I'd like you to write it down in your journal and there's a there's a qualifier on Number one, it's not a prediction. I'm not interested in what you think is going to happen in 20 years. I want to know what you want to have happen in 20 years, A. And B, I want you to phrase it in positive terms. And it's for the whole world, and it's the big picture. Now, what I mean by positive terms is the following. Instead of saying, I want a world where there's no hunger, or there's no war, or there's no this or that. I want you to phrase it positively. I want the world to be where everybody is well fed. Or, in, or instead of there's no war, there's peace. I want you to phrase it positively because I'm interested in what you are for, not what you're against. So you're going to have all of a minute and a half to write this out. Where do you want the world to be 20 years from now? more time. All right, nobody raises their hand, we will stop. And I want one of you to give me one of the qualities you want the future to embody. And then we're going to go on to the next person. Don't repeat anything that somebody else has said before you. So what is one of the things you want the world to look like in 2032? I want a world where there's unprecedented global cooperation with countries working together to find new technology, new energy, new resources, and just doing their best to uh, increase and increase the ability of our Earth. Just 
All right, so abbreviated, I'll just say the first two words you said was unprecedented cooperation and, uh, amongst all the nations of the world and the peoples of the world and the different ethnic groups of the world, the religions and everything else, unprecedented cooperation. And how about, let's add, respect. Respect and cooperation amongst all the peoples, nations, governments, corporations, NGOs, and human beings in the world. Peace and war. Peace? Peace and war. Peace. Peace for everybody. How about peace and, uh, we'll add, security. Uh, not only are there no wars, violent acts between nations, people shooting each other, but it's totally safe for anybody, for my 13-year-old daughter to walk down the streets of any city in the world at any time of the day, at 3 in the morning, and be totally safe. So it's safe and secure. Yes? Um, I want a world um, that is better for all humanity in terms of, um, term of resource distribution, where resources are distributed equally, and, uh, and the rule of law is being practiced. Okay, so resources are more uh, fairly available to everybody. It's peace and secure, and there's unprecedented cooperation. What else do you want? Yes? Um, I'd like a global society to rely on the systems inspired by nature. Okay. The, our technological systems are inspired by, based on nature. I want a world in which love, liberty, and fairness is the standard for cyber humanity. Okay, so in 2032, love, love liberty, and fairness is the standard for cyber humanity. Okay, instead of, you know, poverty, or instead of power and uh, money and whatever, greed. And greed and, okay, so we've replaced greed, power, no fear. Exclusion. Everyone have, has a say in the way the money is served, and their opinion is all taken to be equally important. Okay. And they have a say about the resources and how they should be used, and sparing and being fair for the generation after we leave. Good. What else? You. So the law sharing the know how to invent and respect the law. <laughs> so the the sharing of know-how yeah, know and technology yeah. and okay what else uh, clean and abundant bioregions and waterways so the environment clean sustainable environments the air is clean the water is clean the land is not being you know we're not dumping garbage on it the oceans are clean uh, the rainforests you know everything is that has been damaged up to now is being allowed to regenerate, come back, and we're not doing any more environmental damage. Yes? Healthy population. Oh. Healthy population. Healthy. Healthy. So 100% of humanity has got access to great, the best health care. Not just those living in rich parts of the world have got super expensive access to health care, but everybody in every part of the world has got access to the best available health care. Whether that's doctors, nurses, health technicians, hospitals, medicine. So health care for everybody. Yes? This might go on with global cooperation, but like no barriers at all. Everyone understands each other and can communicate. And okay, so no barriers. Are there no longer uh, anybody can go anywhere at any time without a visa? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's no restrictions on travel. Um, and the other barrier you mentioned, if I go to China, I will have a problem uh, speaking Chinese. And there are, so maybe we have some sort of way of translating. You know, right now there are there is technology out there that will I can speak in English and out will come some other. So we've got some way of communicating on a one-to-one -one basis as well. well. How about good politics? What good politics? Good politics and administration. 
Okay, so the policies, government policies that are out there are open to, uh, when you say good, we need to define what we mean by good. How about they're not defined by what I think is good or you think is good, but it's a democratic process where we get to participate in the people of the world get to participate in the decisions that impact their life. Anything else? What hasn't been said so far? Yeah, I, I don't know. So at this point, it's so difficult countries, uh, such a question, but uh, 20 years is another long time. So if we go back to this, for me, like go back, back 20 years to 1992 and see what has changed these days. So, like, you know, so I'm not you, asking for a prediction. I'm asking what you yeah, want. So hopefully we want to see more as a more peaceful place. Like, Sure that international institutions with the margins of development and developing countries. But uh, just remember that 20 years is a long time to make such a change as like uh, the same language or borders or trying to do like. I'm not, asking, I'm not asking for an assessment of whether it's feasible or not. All I want to know is what you want in 20 years' time. We forget, oh, well, we can't afford it or anything else. I just want you to know if you want everybody to be enlightened or you know, cancer to be cured or anything else, say it. Um, yes, somebody, you, you had your hand up. Um, I said all those things, but I said with being able to, people being able to keep their cultures and like being able to stay different. Okay. So everybody, the unique cultures that are out there are able to thrive and not be homogenized or blended into one global culture, but we may have a global culture, but we also have the unique, distinct groups. What else? Well, I had a lot of views, a couple that weren't mentioned yet. Um, a world where all children are protected. Um, a world where men and women are equals. A world free of disease. Um, and a world where animals are respected and loved. And a world filled with educated people. Okay, so not only do we have access to health care for everybody, we've got education. Everybody on the planet's got access to not just grade school, or they're not just now literate, but they've got access to high school and college, postgraduate. Anybody anywhere can attend any, you know, uh, college level education, plus all the other things you said. What else? Uh, economic quality. Economic equality. Yeah, uh, I would say I want the world where there's uh, where the, where the, uh, another nation state cannot invade and invade another nation state because of resources basis. So we have peace yeah. already. We've got so you want to make sure that um, we've so we've got um, peace and security, health, education. Um, We've identified the, and the environment is allowed to be sustainable or stop being trespassed on. Um, you've identified, you've created a vision of the world, um, an ideal world that is, to say the least, attractive. Um, I've done this exercise with close to 150,000 people, groups of people around the world whether they were in China or Japan or Europe or Africa or the United States, South America, all over the world. Some of them were groups of just engineers. Some of them were groups of corporate executives. Some of them were high school students. Some of them were, so it's the diversity of um, responses to this question. What do you want the world to look like in 20 years? Then I systematically, almost religiously or fanatically, collected the responses for the first 10 years of this. And uh, what we found was very exciting, very, at first very surprising. But every single group had an almost identical set of answers to where they want the world to be. Sometimes, uh, in some parts of the world, you would have some what I'd call outliers. You know, if you were in Chicago, you would have somebody who would always say, well, the Chicago Cubs, a baseball team, wins the World Series. You know, in Philadelphia, they'd say the Philadelphia Phillies. But excluding those local qualifiers, you know, the, their, the home team, soccer teams or something, wins the World Cup. Other than those, think this is what it looked like. Uh, 
what people wanted around the planet. They wanted abundant supplies of food, clean water, adequate housing, good education for all, clean, safe energy, healthy environment, access to health care, all of this stuff. Um, if I gave you enough time, we'd replicate this list. What it boils down to is the basic human needs of everybody are met, the basic human rights are fulfilled, uh, and the environment is allowed to be healthy. So every single group that I've done this for has got this as a um, solid foundation for where they want to steer spaceship Earth. So if you were the pilot of the spacecraft, these are the destinations that you would be steering towards. This is also the decision-making criteria that you would use in choosing between different alternatives. You know, does it get us closer to the basic human needs being met or basic human rights fulfilled or uh, the environment allowed to be regenerated? So that's where uh, a lot of people think we should be heading it. Now granted, out of 7 billion, 150,000 is not a huge sample, uh, but it's, it's fairly sizable uh, in my book. I think there is some unanimity, unanimous uh, sensibilities about the directions we should be heading in. But everybody, not just us in North America, or not just us in England or uh, Japan or wherever, should have basic human needs met and have our basic human rights and live in a clean environment, and the rest of the world should, you know, suffer uh, the consequences. All right, so the real question then becomes is if this is where the pilots, the navigators, the crew of Spaceship Earth think we should be going, why aren't we going there? You know, is this direction an off-the-wall fantasy by a bunch of wild-eyed radicals in Chestnut Hill College in Philadelphia? Or is it a doable, affordable option that the planet is confronted with? My bias is that it's a doable, affordable option, um, with the exception, with the exception of one thing, you said a cure for disease. Yeah. With, with that exception, every single thing that everybody said is doable. With no technology, no resources, and it's affordable. Which is important to realize. I mean, we don't yet have a cure for all disease, so it's not technologically possible. What's up on the screen is, is what you got that chart for uh, in your packets. And if you look at you know, some of these things, you know, like eliminate starvation, malnutrition up there, it says $20 billion, uh, which is a you know, staggering amount of money. Uh, this is what it would take to eliminate hunger and malnutrition from the planet. But it's not $20 billion, it's $20 billion per year for 10 years. So it's a huge chunk of money. Right? And it's not people in the United States going to the local grocery store, buying a bag of groceries, putting them in a box, and shipping them off to some place where people are hungry. It's setting up sustainable food systems in all parts of the world. So at the end of you know, 10 years and $200 billion, the whole world has got a sustainable source of affordable, clean, healthy uh, food for everybody. But $200 billion is, you know, way we can't afford that. I mean, we've got the technology and the resources to pull this off. Uh, this one is, I mean, we've known this for close to 30, maybe almost 35 years, um, that we've had the resources, the technology to pull this off, to make this a reality, but cost a lot of money. Uh, putting it in some sort of context to see what kind of money, this is what it took to eliminate smallpox, this little square here, so that's pretty big. Uh, that's a lot of resources, $20 billion, but this will put it in some kind of context. The United States spends $40 billion every year on dieting, on trying to take off the excess uh, poundage that they put on, uh, and that's just the U.S. 
All right, so $20 billion in that context doesn't look that big. It's also uh, 20 billion is uh, way less than what people in the wealthy part of the world spend on their pets. All right, so looking further, you know, you look at um, one of these other ones, you know, eliminate illiteracy and uh, provide clean, safe water. Uh, this one, uh, let's go back. This is clean, safe water, you know, 12 billion. That's what six months of what we spend on video games. Uh, the other one, uh, eliminate illiteracy, 10 billion. Again, these are yearly figures for 10 years' time. You know, the six months of what U.S. teenagers spend. Um, the uh, health care, three months of what the U.S. spends on alcohol and tobacco. The point of those little uh, <coughs> factoids is, is that it's not going to bankrupt the world to create the world that you envision. We've got the technology to make the world match your values and what you would like to see, with the exception of a cure for all the diseases out there. But to get us the education we want, the health care we want, the shelter, the food, water, all of this. And where this stuff comes from, you, know, you saw the chart. Um, the back side has got a paragraph that will explain it. But you want the chapter and the footnotes, there's a website that goes along with this that instead of giving you a paragraph that describes what you might do to get rid of hunger and malnutrition from the world, there's, you know, 20 pages and 8 pages of footnotes and stuff. That's on the Big Picture Small World website. And to put this in another context, the bigger picture, is you, you know, take what was filling the screen before and put it in this you know, big picture expenditures, global military expenditures, this is now a little bit higher, considerably higher than that. Um, so annual for about less than 25% of what we're spending every year on the military, we can meet the basic human needs of everybody on the planet, basic human rights, and clean up uh, the environment at the same time. All right, to put it in an even larger context, um, the U.S. can afford to do it. This is what, you know, the U.S. military is spending. Um, it's also annual military expenditures. It's about um, what we're spending around the planet for illegal drugs. It's also, according to a World Bank study, uh, approximately equal to the corruption on the planet. The uh, bribes that we're paying uh, around the world to governments and corporations, and etc. Uh, so the point being, we can afford to do it. It's not something that's so extraordinarily expensive that there's no way us folks as human beings on this planet can not uh, pull it off. The technology's there, the resources are there, the money's there. All right, all of that is uh, the good news. Uh, you know, the, the, the good news is the world can be made to work for everyone with present day technology, no resources and standards of living, you know, higher than anyone currently enjoys at a cost that is easily affordable. That's the good news. You know, the bad news is not going to happen. I mean, it's not going to happen unless something else happens. Uh, I don't want to be too negative here. You know, it's not going to happen because it's not happening or maybe it's happening at such a slow rate, but it could happen at a much faster rate unless if you make it happen. You know, you get involved, you use the leadership skills, the problem scaling skills you already have, the power you have access to, to make this world that you saw a reality. That's what the lab is about. How do you pull this off? How do you steer the spacecraft in the direction we want it to be going? How do you create the alternatives? Part of it is, is knowing what the problem is. Another huge part is knowing where do you want to be going? Who wants to create a bridge unless you've got a destination? So you want to determine this preferred state, this vision of the future. And then you can start working on how do you build the bridges that get us from here to there. All right, so um, all of this is um, dependent on the assumption that you can change the world. And if you can't change the world, what are we doing here? Uh, we're just
just observers <laughs> of whatever's going on. And um, I'll contend that we, as small groups, and that you, as an individual, have the ability to change the world. And so the question is, how does the world change? How do you change the world? One is, the world is currently changing. There's about five, six, seven ways the world is changing. One very slow way the world is currently changing, it's called evolution. <coughs> Things move, you know, at a very slow pace, <coughs> biologically, from, uh, you know, science has documented rather thoroughly that this is a real phenomenon out there, but it's a little bit too slow for my taste in terms of if a hungry child is out there, evolution is not going to solve that problem. There's also revolution. There's a couple kinds of revolutions. There is a non-violent revolution. You know, there was something called the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, uh, information revolution, basically technological capabilities that show up out there. And, you know, we learn how to uh, cultivate crops and animals, and then we learn how to cultivate uh, minerals, you know, iron, steel, uh, turn it into steam engines, etc. The Industrial Revolution comes along. Now, you know, we're in the midst of this information revolution. Basically, technology evolves, causing revolutions in the way we relate to the world and the capabilities we have. Without those revolutions, we wouldn't have, when the agricultural revolution showed up, we had about 10 billion people in the world. We've gone from that to you know, about a billion, the industrial revolution shows up, a billion and a half, almost two billion, and then the industrial revolution shows up and we shoot up to where we are now. Um, so there's also the political revolutions, the, uh, or, you know, the violent political revolutions, such as what this country, this United States of America, is based on, was a violent political revolution where we fought the English, uh, the Russians had the Arab Revolution, the French, the Cubans. It's another model of change, rapid change, political change. Um, there's nonviolent revolutions, or social movements, and by, by Gandhi, Martin Luther King, um, others that are out there trying to change the world that way. Um, there's other science changes the world. You know, we talked about, you know, Einstein yesterday. Um, I mean, some scientist comes up with something that leads to uh, the transistor. The transistor is taken by some applied scientists or technologists, and then the economy, and it shows up uh, in a way that, you know, I remember the first way, place where when I was a little tiny kid, the transistor showed up in the world as transistor radios. Um, tiny little radios that had two or three transistors in them. These things here, your computer's got hundreds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of transistors in them. Um, millions of transistors. So science has transformed the world. Uh, business transforms the world. Business, you know, who got that transistor radio out there? You know, maybe basic science and business discovered the principle, applied science took that basic principle and uh, made a way, figured out a way of uh, manufacturing it, technology made it, and then business, though, got it out into products and delivered it around the world. So business changes the world as well. Um, and design science is a name I'm giving to a, another um, category. Actually, let me, business, let me go back to business for a second. You've got a category of human beings in the business world called entrepreneur. In a sense, they're a revolutionary, only in a business environment. There's somebody who is um, disrupting, revolutionizing the environment. You know, when Steve Jobs shows up, or his company shows up, with a new tool, a cell phone, for example, the iPhone, he, you know, puts our, let's go even back a couple generations to the computer. It's a totally disruptive technology that destroys a lot of, of other uh, companies. Like IBM, the then world's largest corporation, almost goes out of business. You know, they, they almost became like the dinosaurs. If they didn't change their business model at the, almost the last minute, they would have gone down like General Motors would have gone down uh, 
uh, if the government didn't step in and rescue them. So entrepreneurs who take an initiative, see, you know, the better way, a better mouse a better cell phone, a better iPhone, a better uh, tablet computer, or a better way of accessing information that you can carry with you, whatever it might be, they come up with it. The whole other part of the world is disrupted. The whole other industry is uh, has the rug pulled out from them, under them, and they either go out of business or they adapt real quickly and catch up or come out with something better. So businesses and entrepreneurs change the world. Design science is, in a sense, similar to that, only it's not just trying to, how do we make a large profit? Uh, but because some things don't fit into the profit world, uh, some things that need to happen out there are not always translatable into a business. A lot of them are, but some of them aren't. And so how do you become an entrepreneur of the world, of the social issues that are confronting us human beings. And so design science is a way of changing the world by recognizing what the problem is, coming up with the preferred state. And the preferred state isn't how do I maximize my own well-being or the amount of money that flows into my pocketbook or bank account, but how do I maximize the benefit that will accrue to the world. So how do you change the world? There's a variety of different ways. There's governments. A lot of you, I think, based on the little bit I've got to know, you think that government is the main way that you know we enter the world and change it. And that's true. Governments, you know, have huge budgets and can make you know changes. Their job is to you know set up the rules of exchange and make sure people can function in the world in an equitable, fair way. But there are other uh, things as well, business, the private sector, there's also civil society, and there's individuals that can enter the world and uh, make changes. Um, they have different focuses. Governments are geographically focused. You know, Tanzania's got, you know, or the United States or China's got boundaries around it. You know, here's the boundary of our country, and we're focused on what's inside that boundary. You know, what's inside the boundary of the United States when we go outside of our boundaries, it's like, uh, how can we influence the policies of the rest of the world to benefit us? So it's geographical. The business sector is focused on profit. Civil society is focused on an issue. You're, you know, civil society having to do with women's issues, um, that's the issue. Or if it's fo focused on the, you know, Greenpeace is focused on the environment. Uh, if you're focused on human rights, it's, it's a, you know, issue that transcends um, geography. You're interested in the environment, whether it shows up in China or the United States or the oceans, whatever. And the individual is usually focused on well-being, the means of change, governments, policies, programs, ways of making wise decisions that will impact the world. Businesses come up with new products and services that solve problems, meet needs, and therefore people will buy them. Um, you can look at the needs of the world as markets. That's what a lot of businesses do. Uh, they're now working on ways, how do we make products that we can deliver to people who normally didn't fit in to that world. There's a whole division of economics called BOP, B-O-P, base of the pyramid. You know, you've got a pyramid with at the top Bill Gates, the rich and the other richest people in the world, and then there's about 10 million, no, there's about 18, 1,800 billionaires in the world. And then there's about 10 million billionaires, and then there's this you know, global middle class, and then there's this bottom, the base of the pyramid, the folks that are making less than $5,000 a year, some making less than $500 a year. And usually, the business world has been focused on how do you reach the top? You know, the billionaires, the millionaires, and the global middle class. Now, the base of the pyramid, this whole division is at schools, programs. You know, Cornell, uh, University of North Carolina, there's about 10 other schools that have, throughout the world, that have these base of the pyramid programs aimed at how do you develop products and business models that will reach the poorest of the poor. Gentlemen of Michigan State, uh, C.K. Pranahal, an Indian guy, unfortunately died a few years ago. He um, pointed out that the poorest of the poor, 
out there on the planet that Western businesses associated uh, are had in a stereotype in the world. Well, they don't have any money, which was sort of true if you looked at them individually, but collectively they spend about $10 trillion. And if we can figure out how to deliver our products to them in different ways and the products are scaled so, so that they're appropriately matched to their needs, we could make a living. Make a killing, but make a good deal of money. For example, Unilever in India. People in the United States buy detergent, laundry detergent, sometimes in 10, 20, 25 pound boxes which makes it too expensive in the poorer parts of the world, in rural India being one, people buy individual packets of detergent. You know, just wash one set of clothes, this little tiny uh, packet. And once Unilever woke up to this, they revised the formula, didn't have it manufactured in one central factory, just had a whole series of regional factories manufacturing these little packets that were, were like two cents to one and a half cents each instead of $25 for a big box or $30 for a big box. You now sell them in these individual packets from the corner of grocery stores or the, the stands on the street. You know, this is the largest growing sector of business for Unilever. It was so successful in India, they cloned the program and took it to Vietnam. They're doing it in Brazil now, going after the base of the pyramid market. Um, it had a, they had to radically reconfigure their thinking, their whole business model. If they couldn't, you're not going to sell um, Cadillac to the poorest people of the world. You might be able to sell, you know, a bicycle, or you might be able to sell a low-cost car. Um, Tata Industries in India is trying to make a, you know, thousand or twelve hundred automobile for the rising middle class in uh, India. But you've got to, with this Unilever and their series of products, it's no longer limited to just laundry detergent. Uh, they had to rethink how it was manufactured and distributed and the pricing structure. So there are ways, all of this is to say, there are ways of uh, reaching almost everybody in the world with a product that will meet some vital need. Um, nobody has figured out yet how to feed starving people in through the business model. So you still need relief agencies when you know the environmental systems, the rainfall is not you know happening, or there's been some political problems, revolution, terrorists, whatever, that have most forced people to migrate from one part of the world to another, and now they don't have their farm anymore. They've got to rely on external aid. So there's needs for civil society, uh, as well as business, as well as government, to make it uh, work. So there's means of change. There's uh, how people you know, can innovate um, individuals, Examples of people that have done things, you know, changed the world. Henry Ford uh, came along. Henry Ford was, in a sense, um, the Steve Jobs of his day. Henry Ford was not just the head of a huge multinational corporation. He started out wanting to build automobiles for poor people. There was lots of automobiles out there. The first place they showed up were wealthy people who could afford. Just like, you know, a flat screen TV show, the only people that can afford them because they're $10,000 a piece are people with a lot of money. Uh, Ford shows up and says, I want to make a car for people who can't afford the rest of the cars, mainly farmers. Because America at the time was a by predominantly rural society. We wanted to make these Model T Fords that could be afforded by everybody, including his own workers. Uh, so he was a revolutionary in his time. <clears throat> Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Apple won their purpose, not so hidden purpose, was as radical revolutionaries. They were sick and tired. In fact, the only way they could get access to a computer were mainframe computers, and you had to wait in line, and, and it was like you had to be very wealthy business uh, to afford a computer. They thought that these tools were uh, vital for other people to have. I don't think they had any vision of how incredibly revolutionary they would be, how they would totally change the way 
people on this planet communicate and do business and court and do everything else under the sun, uh, but nevertheless, their original impetus, the two of them, was to create a tool that took the computer out of corporate hands and gave it to the people of the world. Fuller did the same thing with housing and a variety of other things, trying to, how do you get this stuff, how do you solve the problems of the world? Right. So um, it is time, not just for a break, but it's almost time for lunch. Um, it's very important that we be in this room at five minutes to one, because at one, um, we will have a distinguished